our Lenten song. Stay standing for our Lenten song. This is the season of Lent. The color of Lent is purple. Yeah, purple. <laughs> Lent stretches for 46 days from Ash Wednesday to the day before Good Friday, which is called Monday Thursday. Lent is actually, that's 46 days stretch, but Lent itself is actually only 40 days because it is not considered that you count Sundays as part of Lent. Why is that? It comes from a Jewish tradition. During the Jewish High Holidays, if it's a period of fasting, you don't necessarily have to fast on the Sabbath, because that is a day of rejoicing. So, if you gave up something for Lent, okay, you can have it today. <laughs> or you can go hard car and just keep going for the 46 days. The name of Lent comes from an old English word which means to lengthen. Thank you. We are not only experiencing the lengthening of the light and the days, we are lengthening and stretching our soul during this time. And our ceremony, our ritual for Lent, is to put out one candle each week as we walk towards the darkness of Good Friday. On Good Friday, the Christ candle will go out as well. So we're going to sing together our legend song, As the Sun with, long, sun with Longer Journey. It's on your screen, and I'm going to put out two of the candles. Self-discovery can be humbling and even fearful journey. Indeed, but we do not stay in darkness. Our God, our guide, our inner wisdom, however we choose to know the presence of love in the world, assures us that there is nothing in us that, brought to the light, will not be met with love. In fact, when we turn over our lives to our higher power, we are as certain of returning home as the path of the sun is set before it rises and sets. Please pray with me. God, by whatever name we know you, and however we experience you in our individual lives. Thank you for this new day, its beauty and its light. Thank you for the opportunity it brings to be born again. Free me from the regrets and limitations of yesterday. Release me and others from any effects of my wrong mind. May I see the love and innocence of all humankind, 
planted more deeply than all that troubles us. May I pray, dear God, for life and goodness to see, to give to others wherever I go. And may I know the joy of being used for your service and your good. So let us gather, for our love will transform the world. because you walk into the room and we're all like, ah, Alexa, Alexa, Alexa. Sit and sing is happening after church today. This is a super, super informal gathering that happens right here. We sing songs we love. Sometimes we find some to sing in church services. You don't have to do that. If you have an instrument, bring it, play it. We just sit and have a good time together. We're going to sing tonight in the community room. This is becoming a hot neighborhood event. Super popular. Um, I hear nothing but wonderful things. It is amazing fun. If you can bring $5 to support the cause, that's fantastic. But regardless, they're happy to see you. This is the absolute last call if you have warm clothing to donate or blankets for the warm clothing bank for our meal program. Uh, the last date is two weeks from now, and then we're going to start clearing things out because we do repurpose that room. So if you got it, bring it now. Runs and Sales United has come up with new envelopes for anyone who's visiting, who doesn't give regularly, but who wants to support uh, all of the work that we do here. You'll find that envelope in your pew. If you fill out your personal details of some kind, we can give you a tax receipt. Did I get that right? Yeah. Okay. Equinox Gathering. Woohoo! I'm just looking at you. I'm filled with joy. Uh, Tim led a solstice gathering in December and is now going to lead an equinox gathering um, in Hyde Park, as you see, meeting at the Labyrinth on March 21st at 6.30-ish, 6.30. Um, the theme is finding your balance, which of course is perfect for the equinox, it being the moment when we are balanced between light and dark. It is a mystical place to be, the Hyde Park Labyrinth, and I cannot think of anyone who doesn't crave more connection with nature, more connection with their inner wisdom and inner spirit, and more connection with balance in their life. So thank you, Tim, for leading us. I'm so looking forward. Kathy's going to talk about the wine and cheese. Good morning. The wine and cheese, March 24th. We need you. Linda Pleat is taking the names of willing and wonderful volunteers for the night before, the day of, and the evening of. So please see Linda. There's lots of really, really fun things to do. And as Anne said, it's a great way to get connected with the community. Oh, Linda. Yay, Linda Pleat. <laughs> Linda Pleat. But don't worry, she'll be back there with the flip chart, taking your names. Phone numbers, bank account numbers. <laughs> Teasing, you know that. But it is our big fundraiser, so it would be so awesome if you'd all get behind it in any way you can. Even using your social media, if you're on any of those various channels, to uh, to put it up there, put our, put our poster up there. Um, but the next thing is we need to sell tickets, because without people at the wine and cheese, well, it's not really worth it. So. It's such a great opportunity to introduce people that have never been here to our wonderful community. So there's that part. Plus, it's a really fun evening, so if you owe somebody a dinner invite, this is your way of kind of skedaddling around it. You come to the... <laughs> you don't have to clean your house. We you have our, you know, our, our gymnasium cleaned up for you. So, you know, buy them a ticket. Bring them along. They'll be hors d'oeuvres. You can have wine. There's non-alcoholic beverages. There is wonderful music, wonderful jazz music by our, our very own Anthony. And um, the silent auction is so much fun. It's so much fun trying to outfit another person. I can't tell you what it brings out in people. <laughs> Hovering over the papers. And then there's the live auction too, which will have our very own Randall. will be there as our very live auctioneer. So there probably will be dancing, I don't know. So 
and it was Randall. So what usually happens is people come to see me and they take a number of tickets to sell to people because we must be optimistic. So whatever your own, you think, oh, wouldn't it be nice to take Frida or ask Jolene to come or, or Herbert or whoever it is. Um, you'll have a ticket with you and ready to sell. As well as we've introduced a new innovation, we're using Eventbrite, so you can actually do it online. Now the advantage of the paper ticket is you've got it in your hand and something physical is always really good. But for people that are far away, they can buy their ticket and they can also make a donation. We're going to be adding a little button there too, so if they can't come to the evening, they can make a little donation. So that's what we're up to. Please see me afterwards. Please see Linda after service today. Thank you. of sharing Good Friday services with Parktail United Church. It is their year to host this year. The information's up there, and of course you're going to be seeing it every week between now and then. I just do point out that their service is at 11 o'clock, not 10.30. Ways we love the world. I haven't done this for a while, and there's always something. A very few days ago, a couple weeks ago, a group of parents called the church, looking desperately for a space where they could find an industrial kitchen and a gymnasium at a very reasonable rate. Hello? We always ask, what are you going to do? And amazingly, this group of parents has formed their own sort of charity group with their kids. And they try to get together every so often and do an activity that raises some money and does some good. So we made it very accessible for them to be in our kitchen and gym. And they came and baked dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of baked goods for Covenant House. And they also put together um, a plan to raise some money, uh, cash as well, for Covenant House, wonderful charity for street youth. And they took their kids on a jaunt through Hyde Park. They had the best time. They want to come back. We make this place accessible and pleasant and warm and welcoming and supportive in so many ways. And that is the way that we love the world. So good on us. Okay, we've got a few kids with us today. Billy Jane is going to go out with the kids and do fun things. What are you doing, Billy Jane? I didn't even ask you this morning. Oh, um, we're talking, the theme is mountains. The theme is mountains today. Okay, I'm intrigued by that. The top of the mountain is the goal, and yeah. the top of the mountain is where we can open our spirit. Yeah, and talk, and yeah. The I love that. I, I swear, you know, we know that there's such an issue with anxiety in adults mm -hmm. and kids today. I swear, this would be greatly alleviated by, for most of us, if we spent that hour with Billie Jane. <laughs> so, I'm serious. Okay. All right, we're going to get the kids going with singing like a rock, like a rock, so everyone's going to stand. And if you are a young person, you want to come over and find Billie Jane and with her. You guys ready? If you don't know the actions, I'll stand here and you can watch me. It's super fun. Here we go. <clears throat>
I'll tell you what was going on there that brought it on. But the basis of the great debate was who are you? Okay? So here's the joke. <laughs> so this woman uh, with a very devoted husband has quite a lengthy illness. Sadly, she passes away. She's in heaven. She's being well looked after. She's having a pretty good time. She's taken up canasta. Uh, one day, uh, St. Peter, you know, who, who is at the gate, comes to her and says, uh, Monica, uh, I have to go for the day. Got some stuff to do. Need to go negotiate with hell. You know, and they took another one of the priests, and I, I had to make some kind of show about it. Um, can you just man the gate? And she said, sure. And he said, well, do you remember how you got in? And she said, well, yeah, I remember I stood at the gate. Uh, and you came over and you asked me a question. You asked me to spell a word. And he said, right. And what was the word? And she said, love. L-O-V-E. And he said, right. And you could get in. So you got this, right? Whatever comes up. So Monica's standing at the gate, standing at the gate. Very slow day. Um, you know, our health care is like excellent, so no one's back. Uh, and finally, this guy appears. And it's her husband. And she says, honey, oh my gosh, I can't believe you're here. I have missed you so much all this time. What's been going on with you at Earth while I was gone? And he said, yeah, it was some suffering. And he said, well, no, it's actually it's not too bad. I mean, you know, remember that really attractive red-haired nurse you had? I married her. And then I just sold the house. I know you loved it. And we went on world cruises, like one after another after another. And you know, I know you wanted me to put our son through college, but my new wife and I decided that we needed a beach house. So it's really actually been quite good. And Monica went, okay, that's great, honey. That's terrific. Now, there's just one thing you have to do before I can let you into heaven. You have to spell a word. And you just establish an Go. <laughs> Thank you for laughing because you may not be <laughs> Okay, so the great debate. To have a debate, you need two people. And it is a different kind of conversation. Actually, you know what I think I'll start with? Who, who grew up in a kind of church tradition of any kind? Any kind? Sorry? Yeah. Okay. Um, who, who was Roman Catholic? Anybody? Any Roman Catholics? Oh, hi, Roman Catholics. Uh, Presbyterians? Hello. Uh, what else we got? Baptist? <laughs> Anglicans? I really think they get stuff right. I like the Anglicans. Uh, Methodists? Yay! Hi! Uh, anyone Jewish? In the background? No? Anyone Islamic? Have I missed any of the denomination? United Church. Because there's so many United Church. <laughs> them, pe them people. United Church. I always think people came from somewhere else. You know? It's like anybody living in Calgary came from somewhere else. Anyway. Um, okay. So we came from different denominations. So we know that there have been different ways of doing things. Let's stick a pin in that one for a moment. I said that during the season of Lent, I was going to be talking about five periods in Christian history, and I've been inviting people to look at it as if we have walked into a room, a conversation isn't taking part, it's probably quite heated, in fact, and it started before we came in, okay? So we can't know everything that went on in this conversation, but we enter into that conversation in that moment. Last week, the conversation we entered into was the very earliest Christ followers. The people right after the death of whoever this was, we don't have a lot of information. But what we do know is that people started talking about how to love more greatly, how to live like this fully realized person more fully, how to be better with each other. And they did amazing things like suggest that slaves and Roman citizens could spend time together in spiritual study. They did amazing things like wanting the sharing of food to go right across the social barriers. They did amazing things like believing they could stand up to the Roman Empire, and they did. So that was their first conversation, and it truly was a conversation. What do you think? What stories have you heard about Jesus? What do you think that means? But the conversation we're going to discuss today is a really different time. We're fast forwarding to the 300s now. And two significant things happened in the 300s. One was in about 325, Constantine, the emperor of everywhere, I think that was his official title, decided to bring all of his nations together by having a single religion. 
and he chose Christianity. His mother was a really big fan. Uh, Constantine himself did not convert to Christianity until his deathbed, <laughs> right? Because he thought it was too strict, too weird. Uh, but this was the, the state religion. And all of a sudden, from be, going from being persecuted people, uh, if you were Christian, you could own land, and you could have government uh, positions, and everyone was clamoring to get in, right? Well, something else happened in 380 AD. The emperor that succeeded Constantine decided not only was this the state religion, it was the only authorized religion. Think about that. It was the only religion anyone could follow. And during that time, because of that, because Christianity was entering a time when it was no longer conversation among people who wanted to live like this fully realized person, it became an institution with a mandate to keep people in line. Sorry. Why am I sorry? <laughs> I, I, I am sorry. I think about them. I'm so sorry. <laughs> they had to sit down and decide, okay, what is it then that people have to believe? Believe, okay? Like, like you can have any real uh, effect on what people believe, but people had to live this way, do these things, uh, attest to these things, okay? So they sat down and they actually thought about this and decided this is the only way you can understand the divine, and this is the only way you can access the divine. And if you don't, you know what history has shown us, we are going to show you that you've transgressed on the love of God publicly by killing you horribly. Human beings be weird. This was a huge shift. You can hear that, can't you? And in fact, it stopped being a conversation as such among the people and became only a conversation among the hierarchy of the church and it became a subject of debate. And come of the 400s, the early 400s, there were two great debaters fighting to have their view of who we are and who we are with God and who God is to us and who we are with each other, fighting to have their view become the only view. You with me? Okay, so let's meet our debaters. In this corner we have Augustine. Augustine was born into a wealthy and influential family. Um, he, he talks about, in his very famous book, The Confessions, how when he was a youth, he and other youths went into a pear orchard that belonged to someone they knew, and they weren't even hungry, but they stole a pear, and they ate it, and it felt good. Hold on to that story. Because you have no idea what this has meant to humankind. Okay? You got the pear story. Const uh, Augustine, sorry, or Augustine, however you want to say it, um, studied, learned, actually joined a Christian sect, although did not become Christian yet. The Christian sect he really liked hanging out with was one that said that the soul and the body are two completely different things. Okay? Your soul uh, belongs to God and it is untouched, and your body is completely horrible, uh, vile, terrible, and if you give way to the desires of the body, uh, you're a terrible, terrible person. And it's interesting he did that because he gave way all the time. Like, all the time. Uh, Augustine was giving way to the demands and desires of the body in a spectacular manner, manner uh, for most of his younger days. Um, he studied Latin. He spoke Latin very fluently. He flunked out of Greek. Um, and eventually, his mother again, uh, just like Constantine, persuaded him to join Christianity. And Augustine found himself raised to the highest levels of authority. He became Bishop of Hippo, of Northern Africa, at a very young age. A lot of authority, a lot of people turning to him. He was very articulate, and he was going to become one of the, if not the, architect of, the, it's a, a design, of what the early church was going to believe, okay? So who's in the other corner? 
Pelagius, Irish monk. We don't actually have any idea what he looked like. Okay, I'm kind of hoping he does not look like the bottom right because that's scary. Um, all we know is he came from Ireland. We know he was tall. We think he may have been a bit portly because one of the bishops that he goes to see in Rome describes him as stuffed to the gills with Irish pudding. Um, it's significant that there is an established portrait of Augustine and that of Pelagius. Okay? It is significant that when you saw the picture of Augustine, he is wearing his bishop's hat. Okay? He is presented like a saint. And indeed, he was sainted. Pelagius, not so much. We're just grasping to know what he looked like. Pelagius also came from an educated family in Ireland. He excelled at Greek. Take that, Augustine. But Pelagius came from a really different environment, didn't he? Whereas Augustine grew up in the Roman era, around Rome and northern Africa, uh, where the church was becoming very institutionalized, Pelagius grew up in the natural surroundings of Ireland and among legends and myths and mystics, okay? Two sort of really, really different people. Okay, can I have the next slide? So, the two of them each had an idea of who are we. It was decided that the church needed to write down, establish, decide who you are. So it could tell you that, and you could agree to that, or be killed. Okay? I, I, I mean, that's as simple as it was. Okay? They asked Augustine what he thought, and then they heard that Pelagius was saying. And at one point, really soon, these two are going to come together. But let me tell you what Augustine thought. Augustine reached back into the story of stealing the pear when he wanted to decide who are we. And he took the fact that he enjoyed having mis been a miscreant. He enjoyed breaking the rules. He enjoyed doing something that he knew harmed someone else, okay? Just for his own satisfaction. And he decided on the basis of that, that not just he, but all humankind, and you are essentially evil. Do you want to sit there for a second? And does anyone want to say, oh, come on, Anne, that can't be true, it can't be. Uh-huh, yeah, how do we know? He says so. This great leader of the church, this person who is creating the doctrine of the church, creating what everyone is going to adhere to and believe, creating who you are, based his assessment of human nature on that incident. And then he took it to the Bible, and he said, well, look at Adam. Adam fell. Adam made a mistake. Adam put himself outside the love of God. Which is a crazy idea, because if you read the Bible, God never left Adam. Adam may have left the garden, but God was still present, still working, still giving agency. Okay, anyway, uh, because of the fall of Adam, and the sin of Adam, we are all sinners. I am going to read you what he actually wrote as church doctrine, which is gone. <laughs> you burned the thank you, Shauna. The only reasonable response was to leave it out of here. Come on, I'll bet it's on the binder. I wrote it here. This is what Augustine wrote which would become official church doctrine for everybody, right? One religion, anywhere. Humankind, since the fall, fall of Adam, is in a state of spiritual death, utterly disabled, and opposite to all good. Humankind, since the fall, is in a state of spiritual death, utterly disabled and opposite to all good. Who grew up Presbyterian? Is there such a thing as Presbyterian guilt? Hmm. Who grew up Anglican? Is there such a thing as Anglican guilt? Who grew up Roman Catholic? 
So I need to ask you, I'm married to one who grew up Baptist. I would like to say the United Church escaped it, but they didn't. Because I will tell you, when he wrote that, when that became the doctrine of the church, everybody, when the message of the church became, we are inherently sinful, wrong, evil at our core, even when the Protestant Reformation came in the 1500s and the church split into two pieces and the protesters went this way and became us, they kept that doctrine. It was so embedded. I blame Augustine, but I actually get why this was allowed to take hold. Because, you know, if someone tells you you're a green, you're a green unicorn, you go, I don't think I am. But if someone tells you you're a bad person, we believe it. We believe it. And it's not just the church and teaching of the church. It is the teaching of the church. <laughs> it's the teaching of Judaism as well. I don't know about Islam or Hindu. But we believe it because I think we come into this world and we are vulnerable. And we need to find out how to get loved and how to be looked after. And we do all sorts of things that are not helpful to ourselves and others. We look to manipulate other people. We look to better other people. We look to get what we need through, through covert means. We, we think that things like fame or money or power or others or, or gossip or all sorts of things will make us feel more worthy and fill that core of not being enough. So I believe that, well, while I say to Augustine, don't do it, don't do it, oh my God, do you know what you have condemned us to? I also get why this could take hold. But let's hear about Pelagius. Pelagius is summoned to Rome as this doctrine is being put in place by Augustine. And the reason he is summoned to Rome from Ireland is because he's been preaching something else altogether. Okay? One church, one message now, people. He comes to Rome and has to explain what he has been teaching. And it could not be more different. Now, I don't have the actual words of Pelagius because they did not survive, right? Bernard Shaw said, truth in religion is simply the opinion that survived. Good on. Pelagius, though, we know, taught, in fact, your soul is created perfect. You are divine light at your core. You are a piece of God's love. Nothing you could do or say, nothing that has ever been done to you, nothing that you have ever brought to the world that was less than what you would have wished, no harm you've caused, no thing you've been that you'd wish you had not been, nothing can change your essential goodness and perfection. Yeah, you make mistakes. We all make mistakes. Yeah, you go the wrong way sometimes, but sin means to miss the mark. You try again next time. And the good thing is you try then, don't you, from a different place. Not from a place of, I suck, I fail, I'm bad, I'm horrible, there's no hope for me. You come from a place of my beautiful good heart in this moment was all layered over with fear. With thinking the wrong thing was going to be helpful. With being, uh, uh, you know, defensive which is fear. That's a totally, completely different thing, isn't it? And Pelagius also believed, well, didn't believe, in this whole because of Adam nonsense. How, he said, can every one of God's creations be the same as that one creation? How can the sins missing the mark of that one ancient person, I think he even said, should he have been found to exist? Um, <laughs> mean that we are condemned for all time. No, he said, said Pelagius, your soul is created perfectly and is yours. God's walk with you is individual. Yes, we are part of a oneness, but we do not carry the darkness of any other soul with us. This is your walk, your journey, your relationship with spirit, yours to make. And God, who created you perfect, is there for you every step of the way. Could there have been two more diverse opinions? 
Down Pelagius comes to Rome. The debate ensues. Apparently it was brutal, raucous, harsh. And who do you think won? Oh, I've given it away, haven't I? Spoiler alert, we all feel guilty. Augustine. Augustine overwhelmingly was found to have the truth of God. And where are we today? Where are we today? Now I look at the history of what the church has offered and I know there have been such good things. There has been moments of beauty and helpfulness and inspiration. There has been kindness. There have been those who have stood up and said, I believe in the perfection of each human soul. I believe in seeing the good that is there for each of us. But boy, we find that hard to do, don't we? We look at the world and we believe what Augustine said, that there is a bad planted in so many people. We forget that those people are simply trying to find their way of being of value and safe in the world and doing it sometimes in horrific ways. We have things done to us and we think that's who we are. We get it. We get it. But I think at this moment, for those of us who choose a church community as a spiritual path, have such an opportunity. Because just as they were building an institution in those days, and an institution building gets harder and harder and harder and harder, doesn't it? That institution is falling. Like the fall of Rome, they thought they would never come. And isn't that an opportunity for us to do what we're doing today and say, we're choosing another way. We are leaving behind us the darkness, the heartbreak, of shame and blame for ourselves. We are choosing to be Pelagians and see that every heart is perfectly made. Every journey is different for each person. We cannot know someone else's journey, but we can say, you're doing your best. Does that mean that people take responsibility for the harm they cause, as do we? Absolutely we take responsibility and call each other into account for responsibility. But when we believe that we are coming from a good heart and others are struggling with a good heart, it changes how we see our path in the world entirely. We no longer say, my relationship ended, I must be a bad person. I had a fight with my best friend, they must be a horrible thing. We no longer say things like, anyone is unredeemable. We say there are broken hearts all over the world causing harm, but there is a good in humankind, a God-like in humankind, a love peace in humankind in every soul planted more deeply, and I will pray for that peace, and I will honor it in myself, and I will bring it forward to the world, and I will forget this shame and blame nonsense. Because as the church institution falls away, the real stories and teachings of Jesus can come forward. And that was the problem I have with Augustine. What he was preaching was antithetical, not only to Pelagius, but to Jesus. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is inside you. Jesus preached nothing but you are worthy, you are good, I am spending my time with you because I know you are a God of light. And you need someone to tell you that not only are you loved, you are loved. This is a radically different way of seeing a faith path. And it is one which is available to us today because thanks be to God, we can look back into history now. We don't have to maintain this institutional power that kept us locked in old ideas and ancient, unhelpful doctrines. And we can say, I'm choosing my way with my own perfect soul in mind and in charge because that's the way God made me. Does it mean that we are orthodox? Does it mean that we are in step with some of the leaders of the ancient church? Well, orthodox means 
in order. And the ancient leader of our church was this guy, Jesus. And the order he led us in was a pathway to remembering how perfectly loved and perfectly made we are. So yeah, I am very in favor of the great debate because I know who the winner is now. The winner is my God, my guide, my divine light, my inner wisdom, however you want to call it, wherever you find your spiritual center, calling out to you and saying, it's time, it's time. Lay down those unhelpful messages that have pummeled us for so long. Feel the light that you are within. Remind yourself that the things that you have done and things that have happened are not ever who you are. And walk with me into your new world. Thanks be to God. Now wait. <laughs> We're taking a moment at the end of the reflection in Lent for you to have your own reflection. The reflection that I've chosen for today is, who am I? Alexa's is gonna give us a little bit of soft music for about a minute. You don't have to take my lead any more than you have to take Augustine's, although I pick the ages. But spend one moment, perhaps, asking yourself going within with however you know you're divine and ask that essential question. Who am I? It's the most important question we can ask. It colors and changes and informs everything we do in every moment and who we feel, what we feel, and who we are. If you want to choose another question, go ahead. This is your time with God. I believe in the teachings of Jesus that I am wonderfully and perfectly made, and I am loved. So are you. Thanks, God.
resource. The words encompass so much that all of us desire and hope for. As Jesus reached out to serve the world of God, may our hands serve our community in love, that those whose hands are empty are filled. As Jesus reached out to creation, O oh God, may our living become sacred as we walk gently on this good earth. As Jesus reached out to the unwelcome, O oh God, may we befriend those who come into our days, that all may find a home within this community. As Jesus reached beyond the world, O oh God, may your way be held open and give shape to our decisions, our actions, and our way of being. This week, March 8th, is International Women's Day. We give thanks that girls and women are able to participate in roles previously closed to them, and that their significant contributions are recognized. May you bring new hope in the lives of all oppressed women and give them a better life. I give thanks for my mother, whose birthday was March 8th. She inspired our family and her community. I give thanks for my daughters, teach me the ways of a changing, diverse society, and as teachers model equality for their students. We offer prayers on behalf of many people we hold in our hearts today. Bernice, Anna, Jade, Bettina, Diane, Janine, Molly. We say a special prayer for those dealing with mental health issues. As spring approaches, we all feel a new renewal of hope and energy. We continue to pray for the people of the Ukraine during this most difficult and crucial of times. May they feel the love and support of all of us around the world. We pray for Stacy, expecting a baby shortly. May she know how much her mother loves her. Emma asks for a blessing on her sisters-in-law as they try to conceive. Today we offer these prayers, our God. We know we are not alone. We give you thanks. Amen. Please stand for our blessing and benediction and our closing Lenten song, which is Misha Bear. But in closing, let's say, who can look at a newborn baby and see anything but the perfect soul God created? So this week, ahead, let's banish the darkness of shame and blame. If we make a mistake, we'll say we're sorry to the person, to ourselves, to our God. But we will never forget, we are the light of the world. And may the love of God and the grace of our teacher, Jesus, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit rest and abide upon us, everyone, now and forever. Amen. So, Misha Bera, if you don't know, we sing in ancient biblical Hebrew uh, to honor our ancestors. Misha Bera, Avotenu, Makor Havracha, Ibu Tenu. And then it's in English, super simple. And at the end of it, we'll do our three part Amen. Thanks, Alexa, for being here.